Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. Appreciate the introduction. Uh, I am Phil Drake. Um, just a real quick uh, element to what we're trying to do with Tom and myself is I'm going to give a little bit more of the theory and then Tom's going to give you the reality. And so um, as I come from an academic background, I kind of feel good in the theory part. The, uh, following up on your, the point you made earlier, you know, there's a lot that I think is important, especially with this football season coming to a conclusion about being able to go back and do your blocking and your tackling and all the fundamentals. And that's kind of what this first session is, is just to kind of get you back up to speed and some of the fundamentals that you may have uh, forgotten about. So one of the things we want to do is just kind of like reintroduce the language of finance. Um, and, and it really is a language of its own. So uh, behind every story is a narrative. And behind every, excuse me, behind every number is a narrative. My apologies for that. And then what we're trying to do with uh, accounting is link business decisions to valuation. So for a lot of things from my perspective, my students are concerned about what's the value of an, of an asset. We'll go back, we'll revisit the fundamental accounting equation, and we'll look at the financial statement relations, and then we'll have a number of exercises that we're going to get engaged in, and we'll look at some financial statement analysis, and then follow up or end up with uh, follow the money. All right, just make sure we're all on the same page here. Uh, when uh, financial matters come to work, you know, how engaged are you? How comfortable are you? And this is meant to be a rhetorical question. So I don't <laughs> well, won't put you out there yet. You know, someone gives you a 10K, how comfortable are you at going through it? You know, you, you read into the footnotes, uh, all the other elements that go with that. And, and one of my favorite shows, Shark Tank. So I, I love watching these guys uh, and gals get in there and talk about you know, the valuation of a firm, talk about you know, what's driving the economics of what's going on, and, and how do they do that so quickly. So that's kind of what I want us to be able to do is have that kind of facility to be able to speak that language. So just real quickly, uh, like I said, this is going to be more of an overview for most of you. So just uh, pipe in uh, with any comments or questions that you have. When I th as I think of you know, marketplaces, you're going to have capital markets that provide debt and equity. So stocks, bonds. You're going to have lenders and you're going to have owners. So what they're going to do is they're going to provide capital to a firm. And will be financial assets and financial liabilities that are the result of those transactions that go back and forth. And the arrows indicate that there are money flows going back and forth between the firm and the debt holders in the firm and the owners. So if I borrow money, pay it back, that's that top arrow. If I invest in your firm, you know, you and then receive a dividend or have a stock buyback, they that'd be simple that would be emblematic of the uh, second arrow. Then <coughs> we look at the uh, operating assets and liability. This is where the firm does its actual work, where it's engaged in the business of what it's, what it's doing. And so you'll hear this phrase a lot of time, free cash flow. And free cash flow is basically the conversion of financial assets into operating assets or operating assets into financial assets. So. We, we talk typically about how do, how do we fund the operations of the firm, you know, and if I'm not generating enough money in my operations, I'm going to have to bring more money in for my financial activities, either sell off financial assets, go to the debt markets, raise more stock, um, raise more stock. And then on the operating side, I have over here is my operating income. That's the result of my relationship with my customers and my operating expenses, which is going to be the relation, relationship I have with my suppliers. And that's a very broadly defined term. So that just kind of gives me a little bit of an overview of how the flows are with the firm between the capital markets and its product markets. Now, as an accountant, what I'm trying to do is I'm coming in here and I'm saying 
these transactions between the firm and the capital markets, we're going to call financing transactions. Then the transactions we have within the firm are investing transactions. And then lastly, the transactions we have between the product markets and ourselves is going to be operating. So when everything in financing, investing, and operating from an accountant's perspective, this is kind of the framework that we're using to get us thinking through that. All right. As I said earlier, uh, one of the things we're focused on is understanding valuation. So just real quickly, we find that companies invest in all sorts of assets, whether it's people, ideas, equipment, other companies. We're all making these investments because we're hoping that they're going to generate some of those cash flows that we're interested in. The question is, what's an appropriate price to pay for these assets? Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some behavioral assumptions to help you get your mind around it. And the first thing is cash flow. I prefer more cash to less cash. Are we good with that? Yeah. Okay, good. Next, and we'll call that, of course, greed. <laughs> risk. I prefer less risk to more. And we're going to call that fear. Then, timing. I prefer things today as opposed to tomorrow. And I call that impatience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my standard model for determining the value of an asset. So you have these future cash flows. Here, let me just kind of lay it all out for you. It's all nice and pretty. So the value of an asset is the present value from time zero, t sub z, you know, equal to zero, to time t, some future point in the time, based upon cash flows in the future that are going to be discounted back today. Okay? <laughs> Got it. That's the way they teach it in MBA school, correct? And this is why nobody retains it. So let's redo the model and let's look at it this way. What is the value of an asset? Okay? It's based on how greedy you are. Think about those cash flows. What do you think those cash flows are going to be in the future? The more greedy you are, then the more valuable is that asset. Okay? But we're going to reduce, you know, as my fear goes up, my denominator gets larger. When my denominator gets larger, the resulting present value is smaller. So when there's more fear, things are worth less. And then this last aspect is how long do I have to wait to get these cash flows? If I have to wait longer, it's not worth as much. So if you break down the model into how we think normally, and you say the value of an asset, whether it's an idea, whether it's a project, whether it's a business, is going to be based upon these elements right here. Greed, fear, and impatience. And it allows you to kind of just grasp what's going on that much more quickly. Because you're trying to convey a story in its most fundamental elements. So that's where we come in here. Companies are making business decisions about the operations, the investing, the financing activities of the organization. So we go back through all that. And these financial statements capture those events. So what we're doing is we take these business activities, we put them and record them in these financial statements. Now what's going to happen, we're going to show in a few moments, we're imperfect. You would like to think we would capture everything that's relevantly happening. It doesn't. And the key is we're going to look at these financial statements to get a sense about the value of the business. What it comes down to is it's based on expectations. These financial statements are historical in their perspective. But the value is based upon what's going to happen in the future. And more importantly, 
It's based on expectations of future growth and future risk. Let's go back to the model where we had greed and fear. It's the exact same thing. When you look at all these analyst reports that they write, everything they write when they're talking about expectations are couched in either growth or risk. They can all be broken down into growth stories or risk stories. So they're trying to tell you what's going on from an analyst perspective, why they believe these are things are happening. How am I doing so far? Any questions? Comments? Yes? So, how do you quantify risk? How do you quantify it? Risk. There are many number of ways of risk, because risk has so many different dimensions. <coughs> so we can go through, and, and the most common element would go back to that example I gave you just a moment ago. And here, let's go here. This risk right here is typically going to be some kind of cost of capital, which would be based upon you know, your debt and your equity position. But that's just a subset of type of risks that companies face. So it's, it, if I have to quantify, you're going to force me to put something down, I would point to this. But I'm going to also say there's a lot of things that go on. So let me kind of see if I can show you some other kind of risks out here, OK? Let me go back here. One of the things you have to be able to do in understanding financial statements is you have to realize that accountants think differently. They don't see the world as the way you do. We train accountants to be with a certain mindset. So you have to be able to step into their shoes to understand their work product. So what am I talking about? Well, here's my firm, and I call it Acme. Nothing wrong with Acme. It's always a good company. It's also uh, the initials of all my kids. So, Alex, Andy, Casey, Mitchell, and Elaine. And what I want us to do is kind of look at all the interactions. So, from an accountant, what I do is I see the transactions between the customer and the firm. So, I see goods and services going out in exchange for cash or promises of cash in the future. And then I look at the Vendor side, the same thing. I receive goods and services from my vendors, and I pay cash or promises to pay cash in the future. And then I have shareholders that will give me capital in exchange for residual interest. Basically, I don't owe my shareholders anything. They just get whatever is left over. And then I've got my lenders and creditors that provide my loan capital in exchange for principal and interest. You have your employees that provide skills and wages. And this is what the accountants are all seeing. They're looking at all these transactions that happen between the firm and all these entities around here. You your, have your managers that are directing the operations, and they provide their skills in exchange for their compensation. And we come over here, and we have a, the government coming in providing public goods in exchange for its relation. And then I'm going to throw this last little guy in here just to mess with you. And that's the auditor. Okay, And the auditor basically attests to these financial statements and says whether the financial statements um, adhere to the rules of accounting. Okay, So when I go through this with my class, I call this my will of fortune. Okay, If you can manage this will, because all of these people that are interacting with the firm are have their own interests, their own agendas, and they're not all wanting to play nice with one another. And so for a manager, you have to be able to successfully deal with all of these pieces out here. Now, everything that's on this will of circle is what the accountants see and what the accountants capture. But there is so much more. Okay? You have society. You have cultural impacts that will influence how firms behave. Competition. What are your competitors doing? How do you anticipate your competitors dealing with things? Then we have global interactions. We have technology, fundamental economics that we are engaged in, demographics, how are they changing, regulations, what are they doing, what's coming on with those, and then political and legal elements are all in here. All of these are external factors that will affect how the firm plays this will of fortune. 
but the accountant only sees these elements. So when you look at a set of financial statements, you're looking at what's happening here, but you don't see necessarily all these other elements that are pushing on it. And so you want to have to be able to step back and say, what is the accountant seeing? What are they doing? And with this framework, it kind of just gives you a good little sense to kind of think about this. I see people taking pictures of this. Do y'all need copies of this handout? Okay. Is Megan available? When I see, when I see Megan, not at this moment, but that's fine. I, I'll make sure that Megan gets copies to you guys, okay? I can email it, sure. Okay. Yeah. It may be on your flash drive, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to remove, I'm going to kind of remove what's going on here. And, and y'all may remember back from your, you know, economics days, COSIS theorem. This is basically what's happening. The company is a shell. You know, if you really think about what's coming on, what's happening here, all these people on that Wheel of Fortune are coming to this company just like you would come to a bazaar to transact business with one another. It's far more efficient for the vendors and customers to go through that company Acme than to try to do things individually among themselves. So by coming and bringing the company in together, it brings all these participants together as well, and this creates a much more efficient way of dealing with value creation, making things better off for all those participants around there. So the key to making this work, the oil on the wheel of fortune is information. You need good information for all these parties to be able to participate effectively. And that's one of the things that the U.S. capital markets figured out a long time ago when you go back to the New Deal with FDR and the creation of the securities exchange and the securities markets and laws that we had, emphasis changed how information was to flow. You went from a you know, buyer beware to a seller beware marketplace. And we had some modifications back you know, in the 1990s and 2000s. But it does kind of tell you the key thing here has got to be the information that we go. So with that being said, let's continue on with this accounting mindset. Here's everything you ever need to know about accounting. Very simple, all right? Assets equals liabilities plus shareholders equity. Done. Thank you for your time. No. no. <laughs> uh, what am I doing here, okay? What I'm trying to say is that everything the firm owns, it, in essence, belongs to my creditors and to my owners. So all, basically, and that gets back to that picture we t said before earlier, the company is nothing but a shell. And the accounting statements reflect that. The accounting statements say, here are the assets that are held for the benefit of your creditors, your liabilities, and your owners, your equities. And that's, the company itself owns nothing. It just basically holds everything for everybody. Now, of course, it has a legal title, so you know, I don't want you to jump all over that. All right, so let's uh, hop over. I, I do have a handout for you. So I will pass these out now. And I'm not gonna make you go and pass those out for everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just got some of uh, Amazon's financials. And I'm just gonna go through this pretty, pretty quickly. Our financial statements. Okay, we have three primary financial statements. We have a balance sheet, we have an income statement, and we have a statement of cash flows. Now, number one thing you have to recognize is I am an accountant. First thing I lead with is my balance sheet because that's how accountants think. If I get the balance sheet right, there should be more. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I don't know how to count. I know how it works in theory. <laughs> But that application really screws me up. 
All right, so remember, accountants are balance sheet focused. So the key is get the balance sheet right, and then as the balance sheet changes over time, the income statement and the statement of cash flows just fall out on their own, just by the changes. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Everyone have one now? Okay. So here's the balance sheet of Amazon, and you should hopefully have that as your first one. You have the assets at the top, liabilities, insurers, equity down here. We'll kind of go through what those mean in just a second. But just kind of get a list of what is on here for Amazon.com. And I, I'm going to kind of be a little bit rude here, but look at what they have. Cash, marketable securities, inventories, accounts receivable, property and equipment, goodwill, other assets. All of those things are the result of that will of fortune transactions, correct? When you think of Amazon, what do you think of as their best asset? What is it that they do that others don't do as well? Hmm? AWS. I'm sorry? AWS. AWS. All right, so the cloud computing. Logistics. Logistics. They do an extremely good job of logistics, right? Customer service. Customer service is good. What else do you all think about it? They have a large inventory of goods. Yeah, an infinite inventory of stuff, right? You know, they can deliver very quickly. That part of the logistics, correct? Where does any of that show up on the balance sheet? Inventories. The inventories, correct. But you, you see what I'm getting at? Just because it's on the financial statements doesn't mean it's reflecting the economics of the, what the company does. Its ability to satisfy customers' needs and wants better than others is nowhere reflect up here on this balance sheet. And, and that's where you have to understand the company to be able to understand the financials. Because the financials will speak a lot more to you when you realize you're only get, getting a portion of what's going on. Goodwill, all right, one of my favorite things. Goodwill only arises, is only on a balance sheet as a result of an acquisition. Okay, it does not arise because we really like this company and we're going to go put down goodwill. So what happens with goodwill? So I acquire, so I'm going to buy your company. Let's just say right now your company has, I don't know, um, a book value of $6 million. Right? I'm going to pay you $10 million for your company even though the book value is $6 million. So what I do as an accountant is I'm going to come into your company and I'm going to fair value all your assets and all your liabilities. And when I do that, I find out your book value is actually $7 million. And then I'm going to go and look for other kind of assets that are on your, in your business that are not in your books. And that may be another $2 million. Well, I'm still paying you $10 million for $9 million of value, correct? At that point, as an accountant, I go, I don't know. So we throw up our hands and say that difference between the purchase price and what the accountants can identify as the fair value of what's being acquired is goodwill. It's our form of saying, I don't know what it is. <laughs> okay? So go back to uh, Time Warner. Remember that little company buying, uh, you know, AOL? Yeah. $100 billion of goodwill. $100 billion of goodwill. On Time Warner's balance sheet until they wrote it off. That's usually what happens to Goodwill, right? That's what happens a lot. Uh, why does Goodwill show up on the purchaser's balance sheet? Because the acquired firm typically will fade away. It may still operate as a legal entity, but it will now be owned by the other company. And what we're going to do is, let, let, let's just, quick example. Let's say I'm Phil Draco. So that's my company name, Phil Draco. And I own 80% of all of your companies. Each of you is your own company. When I present a set of financial statements as Phil Draco, I'm going to take 100% of your assets, 100% of your liabilities, 100% of your revenues, and 100% of your expenses. And I'm going to combine them all together, stack them up, and then I'll eliminate all the transactions among us. So what is left over is what? How we represent ourselves collectively as Phil Draco to the rest of the world. And so when a company acquires another company, that company becomes part of its financial statements in a consolidated basis. Yeah? Quick, like, probably a question, but um, so it says in millions, so 
Is that 14 million, like 2 million, or is it you add like six zeros? Let's keep on adding zeros to the wazoo. So yeah, so how much uh, cash and equi cash equivalents do they have? They got about 14 and a half billion dollars. Okay, so you add three zeros. Yeah, they, six yeah, zeros? six zeros, yeah. So yeah, just, just recognize it's, it's a really big number. They could buy like the state of Alabama, nobody would know. <laughs> I don't know why, but. We have a good estimate of what goodwill represents at the time, but it will be trued up subsequently. And, and what I do is when I think of goodwill, or when I think of you're going to, an example I just gave, where I'm paying 10 million for what I can identify as accountant as 9 million, is I'm assuming that together we're better collectively than as two individuals. So there are going to be those synergies that people always talk about. And, and synergies to me are two, two very simple things. They're going to be enhanced revenues because I can take your products and services and sell them in my distribution channels. I can take my products and services and sell them in your distribution channels and we can sell more collectively. And that might explain the additional million dollars. Or there might be ways of us doing cost reductions. You got back office uh, you know, costs, I have back office costs. So when we combine, we may be able to eliminate a lot of costs. So in theory, you should be able to justify the delta between what you're buying and the purchase price through being able to identify what the enhanced revenues are going to be, what are going to be those expected cost savings. Now, most companies will typically say, we promised, you know, $50 million in, you know, cost savings, and then tell the, you know, midline manager, go figure out how to get there. <laughs> so. They, ha they will have a sense of what it's going to be. They're not going to know precisely what the final number will be. But they will have, a, you know, it'll be directionally correct as to what they anticipate that goodwill number should be. And Tom will be able to speak to that more eloquently than I. Yeah, well, the way I used to teach the reporter that, that, I mean, I don't think they think much about goodwill when they're doing the transaction. Yeah. The bankers come up with the deal, but goodwill is kind of a dumb asset. The stupider you are, the bigger the number gets. <laughs> And we, we, we do all the research. The acquiring firm typically does overpay and it does not get necessarily the value. So it's hard to find. But they're all accretive. <laughs> you can't do a deal unless it's accretive. Earnings per share goes up as a result. So you won't, if, if the combined companies reduces earnings per share pro, you know, on an expected basis, then that's a bad deal going in and you typically don't see those things going through. Um, so that's assets. Here are some liabilities. And again, these are kind of standard type of things in here. And then the bottom section will be what are the owner's amounts. What you want to recognize here, this is not a market value. This is what the owners paid for their contribution into an organization. So if you have some old companies like Procter & Gamble, they can include you know, owner investments from the 1920s, 30s. Okay. And that gives us the equation that we have, assets at the top, will equal the liabilities and shareholders' equity. So if you'll notice, the 54.5 billion is, makes this thing balance. And, and one of the good things about accountants is that we lack imagination. So when we give you a title for a name, it typically is reflective of what we actually are trying to talk about. So the assets will balance with the liabilities and equities. Go back to the Wheel of Fortune, right. and every time we have one of those transactions, each one of those has to balance. So this equation has to hold every single time <laughs> I have a transaction that I record. And it, it, it's inevitable. That's why accountants are the happiest people in the world, okay? Because they're always in balance, you know? Everything is going to be put on slideshare. 
And if you don't have it, you need to take a copy of it. Not everything. Just getting them all at once. So I was late. It's him. I'm just passing through. The uh but no, I just do it. We'll have everything on slide share. That's okay for everybody. And if you really need to get a copy of it. Uh everything was going to be going to you at the end of all this. We'll go through this. Okay. So the balance sheet uh, represents the, what the firm controls at a point in time. They're always, if you notice, the balance sheet is as a uh, given date. All right, the income statement um, is going to show you the revenues less expenses that result in hopefully your net income or profits, and those profits belong to the owners. Okay? So what you're going to find here is that this is a period of time, so for a year, and so what happens here is you're going to get three different years of comparative data for Amazon. And we're going to start off here with net sales and just kind of tells you this is the amount of the product that we're selling, goods and services that are being sold, and then we go down here and we're going to show you then what were the cost of operations. So the things that we're saying are, you know, cost of sales, fulfillment, marketing, technology, general administrative, and some other operating type of stuff all gets captured and that gives us then our operating income. And the operating income just says how successful is just the core business activity. So when you look at it in income statement, you're just trying to get a sense just in its core business, how is it doing? Then we're going to come down here and say we're going to have all these ancillary type of things that are necessary but not part of our core activity. So <coughs> We may have, you know, uh, that 14.5 billion we saw in cash and marketable securities, they may generate some interest income. Well, that's not their core business. They're borrowing money, and they're paying interest on that. Then they have these other elements in here that are just not part of their core activities, and so we want to kind of bring that in and just say, here are we doing overall? And then ultimately, you want to come down to the bottom line, the net income. And is, you know, Amazon making money in this regard. And they're not showing profitability in this year. They lost $241 million. So that's the income statement very quickly. So let's contrast that. And what you want to be able to do is whenever you have an income statement, you want to also have as a contrast statement of cash flows. Now the statement of cash flows picks up on that initial element where I said earlier about you know, financing, investing, and operating activities. And so when we look at a statement of cash flows, just like a balance sheet, I mean an income statement, it's for a period of time and you're going to have three comparable years side by side. And the first thing we're going to do is you're going to look at the cash that we start off at the beginning of the period. So how much cash do we have at the beginning of the year? And then we're going to say, what was our cash from our operating activities? When you look at publicly traded financial statements, the operating section is a very difficult section to read and understand. It starts off with net income. So you see that negative 241 million and then they have a bunch of gobbledygook underneath of that. And so I'm more than happy to help you with your MBA and we can go through this in excruciating detail but it's, it's the kind of thing where you will want to lean on a Tom person in your organization, drop me a note or whatever, and say, help me understand, because there's just a lot in here. What we're trying to do here are say, in this first section, what are elements that do not affect cash flows, but are embedded in that income? So these are elements that do not affect cash flows, but are captured in that income. Yeah. It's standardized was what's going on. But the, the, the depth of understanding gets, gets rigorous quickly. And then the second element is looking at the changes in the operating assets and liabilities. And this is where I was trying to tell you is as the balance sheet changes, the cash flows fall out. So the way we do this is just insanely crazy. So I've got a billion dollars here, negative billion 39 for accounts receivable. Okay? Well, simple thing. 
if I find that my accounts receivable increased by a billion dollars, what do I know? I sold more than I collected, correct? If my accounts receivable increases by a billion, I sold more than I collected, correct? So what we're trying to do here is trying to say, well, what I sold was captured up here in my net income. What I collected should be down here in my cash flow from operations, correct? To go from net income to cash flow from operations, and I know that I sold more than I collected, I need to reduce my net income by a billion dollars. That's the easy one, okay? This is not fun stuff to do. So when you go through these things, that's what we're trying to do is take advantage of the balance sheet equation and multiply that through there. These are the investing activities. So these are the transactions where I'm either exchanging between my financial assets and financial liabilities, or my financial assets right here, and my operating assets, my infrastructure. So when you look at those, you're gonna see those types of things going there. So you'll see marketable securities in here, and you'll see uh, investments in other companies, as well as investment in uh, assets, uh, operating assets. And then lastly, our, fin our financing activities, and uh, this just shows those transactions we have with the capital markets, with our debt holders and our equity holders. When they talk about sales and purchases of marketable securities, that excludes their own that is correct. debt and stocks, correct? That is correct. This is investments they have in other companies' uh, debt. So typically for most companies, this is going to be investments in uh, government bonds. And then at the end of the day, I show the cash. So we had our beginning cash. Where did cash come in from our operating, investing, and financing activities? Where did our cash go out for our you know, operating and investing activities? And that gives us the ending cash at the end of the period. These, the, this ending cash should be the same number that's on the balance sheet for cash and marketable securities. It's the $14.5 billion. Okay. Um, I'm going to just put this up real fast, and I'm going to talk about this as quickly as I can. This is the formal definition of an asset. It's something of value that's owned by the company. Here's the key element. It has to be the result of one of those exchanges off of that will of fortune. There has to be a past transaction. There's a lot of times where we exchange promises for promises that accountants do not capture. So you guys may write up a report about somebody having a new purchase order, you know, Boeing or Airbus decide, you know, agrees to sell a bunch of stuff to another airline. You know, we're gonna deliver 20 planes. They have a contract for that, all right? You see share price moving. We see all sorts of clamor going on, discussion like that. And accountants absolutely do nothing. They're just sitting there going, nothing happened, nothing happened, because it's not on the wheel of fortune until we see a transaction happening. So that's what you want to pay here. You want to be sensitive to how the value assets are valued. Some assets are at historical cost, some are at fair value. So you need to know which assets are going to be at historical cost, what they paid for it. So all those operating assets, that property, plant, and equipment, typically is going to be at what we paid for it, land, what we paid for it. Okay, and then we kind of went through these examples earlier with everybody else, with, with uh, Amazon, and talked about those very quickly. Okay, liabilities will mirror very similarly the idea of an asset. It's going to be a, an obligation, that's the responsibility of the entity, as a result of a past transaction. So that will of fortune comes back again to help us define. So we have a lot of promises for promises as well that are liabilities. The most common things that we have is, you know, let's say we spill some chemicals underground and now we have an EPA violation and we say, not my responsibility. I, I didn't spill it, okay? So you see people disputing those kinds of things. And then here's a bunch of different things that we typically can use to capture what is going on as far as different types of liabilities. Any of these? 
worthy. I assume you guys are comfortable with all these, right? Okay. Uh, what, what do you mean by capitalized lease? Okay, two types of leases. And this is gonna be changing in a few years. Um, leases can be promises for promises or we may structure a lease such that it actually gets captured as an asset and a liability on the balance sheet. So it's one of the biggest non-off balance sheet items is lease accounting. And so how in the rules for determining whether a lease is to be recorded as an asset and a liability are very, what we call bright line rules. There are four, four, there we go, four elements. If you hit any one of the four elements, you have to record that lease obligation on your balance sheet. If you sidestep any of those four, you keep it all off balance sheet. So you have to go and look in the footnotes. So one of the fun things I like to do is take like Starbucks, and if you look at their balance sheet and you see the size of their balance sheet, and then you go and you look in their footnotes and they tell you what are their operating leases, the ones that are not capitalized, the amount of the obligations is about the same size as the balance sheet. It is, those would just be places where they're leasing space for a store or something? That's for a store, and it never doesn't show up on the balance sheet. So if you don't go and look into the footnotes for something like that, you're going to miss you know, billions upon billions of dollars. I wouldn't that be rent uh, Well, I guess it's the end of the year, but if it's a 10 year lease, why wouldn't it be rent payable going forward? Possibly, but for that push portion that's due in the coming period that they've already agreed to for that, even though it's they're non cancelable leases and they may be for 10 plus years, I'm, it's a promise for a promise, and we don't record any liability because no transaction is taking place. Accountants don't see promises, they only see transactions. It's going to change in a few years. Lease accounting is still being finalized, and we're going to get rid of the vast majority of operating leases, if not entirely. There are two standard setting boards out there. There's the Financial Accounting Standards Board, the FASB, and there's the International Accounting Standards Board, the IASB. And so they're working effectively together to come up with new lease accounting rules. Huge. It's going to bring everything on to the balance sheet. It's going to bring a lot, a lot of liabilities onto the balance sheet. So it will change the structure. There are, they, there, the economics are there for you to see, but the, now the balance sheet itself is going to actually change because the debt and the assets are going to increase. Does that make people like more or less likely to want to lease space? And, 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 and no, because the, the economics are going to be the same. You, you, this is where you have to be careful. You know, I have to be careful. You, know, you don't want the tail wagging the dog. You don't want your accountants running the show. You know, so the accounting should be more of a reflection of what's happening with all these transactions. We're summarizing them, but the economics should be driving. So if it makes good economic sense to lease that space, then it should continue to make good economic sense once it's put onto the balance sheet. So the economics should rule the day. If we find that the accounting's running the show, then you want to step back and ask why is that the case? Because then that's wrong when accounting dominates economics. And that's where you guys get good stories. If these leases are going to show up as liabilities, how, how are they going to be balanced by assets? Maybe oh, because I have a leased asset. They'll be comparable to my leased obligation. Mm -hmm. So it's going to, both sides will raise. All right. Somebody else had a question? No, actually, it was sort of the same question. Who's going to be down? Yep. Me? Yep, remember, we're always in balance. I can't do one without the other. One last question. So uh -huh. it's still a promise for a promise when the cash goes out. Let's say you have to pay the Okay. Well, what will happen then is my cash will go down, right. and then my liability will go down. And what cost? Uh, capital leases. If I had a capital leases, if I don't have capital leases, when my cash goes down, I'm going to be recognizing an expense, which is going to be my share of equity down. Okay. And I'll go into rent expense. Mm-hmm. All right, last section is the owner's equity. Uh, it's what the owners contributed to the company. There are, were, you know, they actually write a check. So paid in capital is exactly what it implies. That's what the owners paid in to buy. Then we have this misnomer, retained earnings. This is the undistributed profits. So the profits that the firm generates off its income statement belong to whom? They belong to the owners. So when we generate profits, Shareholders' equity goes up. Okay, 
Then we pay out some of the profits in the form of dividends. Guess what happens? Shareholders' equity goes down. If, if you struggle with what retained earnings means, don't tell anybody I said this. Uh, think of it like this as an accounts payable to the owners. Never think of this as a resource that can be used. Okay? Hey, you got $50 million in retained earnings. Let's go buy this company. No, 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 no. Your cash is over here on the asset side of the balance sheet. Just because you have $50 million, that's what is due to the owners in essence. And, and I have to use the word due gently because it's, you only have residual interest or you have no obligation to pay like a true debt. And then the last thing is this thing you'll see occasionally called other comprehensive income. And, and this is relatively new, the last 10 years or so. These are things that have an impact on the shareholders but do not meet the criteria of a revenue or an expense. So let's say you have a portfolio of marketable securities and it appreciates in value. You're better off as an owner, but the accountants don't recognize until you sell the portfolio. So we have some of these elements get captured and say, this was something that benefited the shareholders. Capture that, reflect that on. So when you see other companies of income, just think wealth effects, but do not meet the criteria to be a revenue or an expense. Does that apply to real estate? No. Real estate is always a hidden gem. So if you know if a company has real estate on their books, it's probably going to be at what it paid for originally, and there's a possibility that it could have appreciated that's not been captured anywhere in the financial statements because it's never been through a transaction on the Wheel of Fortune. So until there's a transaction, they sell it for that appreciated value, then it would show up? Yep. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So a company that has a several years of losses rather than profits, do they have any retained earnings? Retained earnings? You can go negative in retained earnings. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, that can be a negative number. I've seen that more than once. But it basically means that the accumulation of all the profits, you know, losses have been greater than the profits since the inception of the firm. Okay. All right, I, I'm eating into Tom's time, so I'm going to go through this quickly. You all probably know this already. Assets are listed in order of liquidity. We make a distinction between current and non-current, so we can give you a sense of uh, the solvency of the firm. And we typically find that the assets will be on the left-hand side with the liabilities and equities on the right-hand side, or the assets on top with the liabilities and equities on the bottom. If you work in the international and they have uh, you know, countries that were influenced by uh, Britain, these things will be in reverse. The assets will be in the least liquid first, most liquid at the bottom. Okay, um, revenues are sales, and you have to meet all four of these criteria. So you have to have an arrangement, you have to have performance, you have to have a known or no, uh, knowable price and collectability. This is the key one for probably you guys because there are a lot of people that claim they made a sale, but in reality, they don't anticipate getting paid. And that, we call that a gift, not a sale. <laughs> so, and then cash basis just basically says, I recognize a sale when I get the cash. So. Accrual basis is what the financial statements are going to be for publicly traded companies, but our, ment our mentality tends to be more cash basis. And expenses uh, is basically the cost of the goods and services that were used to generate the revenues. And so what we typically do is we recognize revenues first and then say what were the necessary cost of goods and services necessary to generate those revenues. So we come up with the matching concept where we match expenses to the revenues. You never want to be a person that says match revenues to expenses because then people like me will be like fingers down the chalkboard. Okay, so, um, and that allows us to get profitability. And then basically what we do is we do a peeling onion. You take sales, subtract out the cost of goods sold, gives you a gross margin, 
You subtract out those operating expenses, gives you operating income. Subtract out the other elements that gives you income before taxes. So you can see all these different levels of profitability. And then you have income tax expense down to net loss. And, and from your perspective, you, this should be the most stable number from period to period. This should be the most volatile number from period to period. So when you see small changes in gross margin, it tends to be much more significant than you would probably originalize. There's, we tend to see a lot more changes here. Okay, linking the income statement to the balance sheet. So I have my revenues less expenses. The profits belong to the owners, go as part of the retained earnings. Those retained earnings then come down and become part of the balance sheet. Okay. And I think this will get me through the last little bit of thing I have. Income statement talks about operating. Assets talk about investing. Liabilities and equities talk about financing. So if you ever just want to kind of see where in the balance sheet those three elements come through. The assets represent what the company owns. The liabilities and equities represents what is owed to, the, uh, to others. Equity represents what is owed, again, in quotes, to the owners. So everything that we own, we owe. Revenues come from customers, expenses come from employees, suppliers, lenders, government, and that net income belongs to the owners and goes to the equity. All right. And then last, this lot least, is the um, statement of cash flows that we just said, segmented by activity between operating, investing, and financing. And that's it for me. So. Any questions before I hand it over to Tom? That, that gross margin thing, yeah. is that reflected in the handout that we have? Yeah, you should have that in there. Well, no, you don't. Not they don't, they don't have it. It's margin. not required. This, that is a, oh, there we go. This is a typical. There is, not, there, there is no standardization to how we do these. Every company has their own way of doing it. Correct. Uh, the loss, and so I would be looking at why that is. And you'd like to look at the, how the margins have changed over time, well, and you have to do a little bit of work. I know that gross margins are, are supposed to be stable and net income is supposed to be volatile. Have more volatility. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Sorry, Tom. No it's all yours. Thanks.